sister churches. Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. We've got, uh, we have sister churches. Did you know that? We have churches that, we have one church that meets on Sunday night and they have a Bible lesson. And on Sunday morning, they tune in and they all sit around the big screen TV and watch us. Isn't that amazing? We have, we have a church in another nation that gets up in the middle of the night to tune in, and we're their church. Praise God. Hallelujah. I know we got some more songs. We'll do them at the end. because we, we can do them at the end. How's that? All right? You got more songs? We'll do them. At the, we're on a time schedule right now. Be seated. I, you should never have to watch the clock, but when you got people tuning in, you got to watch the clock. Because they're tuning in at a certain time, you know. We ain't there, they turn off. And we say that in the Ozarks. We ain't there, they turn off. <laughs> we got to be there. Wow, praise God. You guys are awesome. Awesome music. How about that bass player? I'm going to thoroughly embarrass him today. Uh, he didn't want me to say anything. Okay, well, praise God. How about that bass player? Is he, yeah, oh, I know who that is. He, he's playing my bass. That's why I, you know, anybody that plays my bass, I talk about them. Praise God. What a wonderful, smiling group of people. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> All right. Uh, where's Jim? Oh, I'm looking for another gym. We have a lot of gyms. This is Jungle Gym over here. Ah, Jim. How many of you know this guy? He, um, he's in the first service. He sings in the choir in the first service. He has to sing in the choir in the first service because his wife is the choir director. That's right. And That's right. Uh, I was just... Uh, thinking this morning, in fact, I talked to you a little bit about it in first service, but the first time I ever met you, you were doing theatrics. It's true. It's true. You, you were doing a, a part. That's right. The character was who? Herr Zeller, Nazi. I was a oh, don't, mean don't, one. Don't tell everybody you're a Nazi. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, 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 come on. No, we got people clicking off all, all right, over the world. It was right just now. a part. It was just a part. I was a bad guy. I'm not a Nazi. I don't, none of that. Herr Zeller. Was Herr your... Zeller. That would be a nice name for a hair studio, wouldn't it? <laughs> Where do you get your hair done, Hair Zeller? Get your head shaved. Then I'd look like William. There you go. So uh, you were doing this part in, what was the name of the show? It was Sound of Music. Can you sing a little bit of that part? Uh, you better not have me do that. I thought you were going to yeah. take me up on there for a moment. I know. It. Oh, hey, uh, I asked you to share some things. and. Right. Uh, would you mind? I'd be delighted. All right. Delighted. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Pond. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just here to talk about our offering. In a couple of minutes, we're going to continue worship by receiving an offering. Uh, we're going to ask you to bring uh, your offerings, if you would, up to the planters up here. If you haven't had a chance to prepare it, uh, take advantage of this time now, if you would. Uh, if, um, if you'd like... Uh, uh, we also have late offering, uh, a place for a late offering over in the receptionist area. And then for those who've already given online or who have signed up to give automatically, thank you. Thank you for your consistency and your generosity. Um, in about two days, we're going to celebrate a made-up holiday. I didn't say a man-made holiday because it was obviously made by women. Uh, talking about Valentine's Day. All right, uh, any amens out there? All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, before I lose the other half, let me carry on here. Uh, at, did, did you know that last year $12.2 billion was spent on chocolate for Valentine's Day? $12.2 billion, billion dollars. Now, that doesn't count the $7.1 billion spent on non-chocolate candy. You know those little talky hearts, that kind of thing. 7.1 billion. 2009, 379 million spent on flowers on Valentine's Day. 3.5 billion spent on jewelry last year. 
One survey suggests an average person spends $116.21 on gifts for Valentine's Day. Celebrating romance and love doesn't come cheap, and it's clear that people do not mind spending uh, money um, through their gifts of love. Now, each week we have an opportunity to express our love to God through gifts. We offer God the gift of singing, of worship, gifts of service. We also have the gift of expressing our love through monetary gifts. I thought it'd be interesting to see if we expressed our love to God, the same monetary average we spend on Valentine's Day, what that come out to? If we took the average number of congregants in, in, uh, in worship, multiplied it times $116.21, we'd have an average offering of $46,000 and $484. We say, people, can we make that happen? Yeah. All right. Our average offering is much less. And I'm not sure what that says, but I know that today is a special day, and I know as we move forward, uh, better and greater things are on our way. So we invite you to express your love for God right now through giving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the, 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 this Valentine's Day week. Father, we thank you that there is love in our lives. That love comes from you, and Father, we cherish it. Father, we ask that the gifts that are, are given on Tuesday, be received with joy and with an understanding of the love that we have in the hearts for each other. Father, we also have that same love, if not a greater love for you. Father, we prepare our gifts now. We ask that your wisdom come upon us as we decide how we're going to budget our money so that we can stand in faith with you, express our love to you, and meet all the other needs in our lives. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
God, stretch out your hands toward the offering. Let's make this confession. I declare, decree, I proclaim that this offering is more than enough, fully sufficient for every good work that this house has been called to do and multiplied into my house so that I will have all sufficiency for every good work that I have been called to do. It's done. Hallelujah. Do we have any guests here today? You're here for the very first time? Just lift up your hand. Yes, where are you from? Wichita, Kansas. Good to have you here. Anyone else? Yes? Collins, Missouri. Good to have you here. Anyone else over here? Yes. Eldon, 65026. Good to have you here. Anyone else? Let's have a nice warm welcome for our guests. Come on. Good to have you here. Wow. God is good. I am so excited about what we're going to talk about today. Before we get uh, going any further here, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all the gifts and birthday cards and, uh, and uh, greetings and, and just little things, money. I mean, it, it was nice. Thank you very, very much. And I love you guys. You're an amazing congregation. You are an amazing congregation. Oh, see, I'm even wearing cufflinks. Wow, praise God. Good. And the shirt and these socks. <laughs> praise God. No, it's just, it's a, it's a good day. <laughs> Thank you all very much. And we even had some people online who, who gave. Isn't that amazing? Said, we, we want to wish you a happy birthday, Pastor. Kind of nice. So, God's a good God. Well, today I want to talk to you about uh, something that we've talked about before, but I think we're going to see it from a, a little uh, different angle. And for those of you who would like, uh, I'm not going to talk a long time today. And uh, <laughs> we'll uh, have us a couple more songs at the end. And, and God, God is good. God, God is a good God. But I want to talk to you today about hope. And the reason is, is because it seems like there's so many people who have lost hope. And hope is uh, it's something that when you lose hope, it can be depressing. I mean, that, that's when you turn out the lights and sit in the chair and get you something to drink. I hope it's not a strong drink. Get you something to drink and you just kind of sit there and sip on your iced tea and stare out the window and, and just don't want to ever give, get up. In fact, you start thinking about when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there in a sweet by and by and how good things are on the other side of glory. And, and these thoughts cross your mind from time to time. Wouldn't it be nice to just be on the other side of glory? Today. <laughs> you, know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? And why would a person have thoughts like this? Why, why would you want to... Is it okay if I just talk to you today? I think I will. But wh why, why would you have thoughts like that? The only reason is just you've lost hope. Just have no hope whatsoever. You, you just feel like nothing's going to change. 
it hasn't changed and nothing's going to change. And, and a couple th times I, I thought it was going to change. But it, it didn't really change. I thought it would, but it didn't. So you just lose hope. But see here at the church, this is where there should be hope. And some people may say, well, you know, this is a faith church. And you teach faith, and everybody should have faith, and, and hope's okay, but faith is where we need to be. But let me tell you something. You, you cannot have faith without hope. See, faith, this is Bible. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. You must, you must be able to hope. And so then we get into this question of, well, what's the difference between faith and hope? Now, this is kind of a little bit of a complicated definition but just listen to me through this. I don't think you can probably write this down, but because it's kind of long. But listen to this. Biblical hope, and that's, that's the kind of hope we want. Bible hope. Bible hope is the anticipation of a favorable outcome under God's guidance. More specifically, hope is the confidence that what God has done for us in the past guarantees our participation in what God will do in the future. It contrasts the world's definition of hope because the world's definition of hope is just a feeling that what I want to happen will happen. That's what the world has for hope. They just what I want to happen, I, I want to feel like it's going to happen. Hope, Bible hope, is not a baseless optimism or a vague yearning after an unattainable good. If hope is going to be genuine hope, if hope is going to be genuine hope, it's got to be founded on something or founded on someone who we have reasonable grounds of confidence that this something or someone can fulfill what it is that we, we are desiring. See, Bible hope is in God and what he does, and not in somebody else and what they do. In the Old Testament, they were hoping for the Messiah who was going to come. But in the New Testament, and I can go through all the Greek words with you, but just trust me in this. In the New Testament, the word hope has to do with to expect or to await. Now, awaiting has to do with waiting, which means by its very nature that you don't believe that what you're believing for is here but you believe it will be. Now, hope is not faith. But Paul told us over and over again, he said, do not give up your confession of hope. Now, we know faith confession is good, but he didn't say don't give up your confession of faith. He said don't give up your confession of hope. And hope is is believing that what God said he would do, he will do someday. You will get healed. You will someday get out of the financial mess you're in. The person who has hurt you or the love who has left you or the love that you've never had, your heart is broken. Someday, your heart will be healed. Someday, your heart will will not be broken. I mean, there are people who have loved and lost, and there are people who have never loved. But they both have a broken heart. And Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. And hope is believing that someday your heart will be healed. But it's the knowing that today it's not. So while you are in hope, you could be hurting severely. You could be sick, broke, and hurting. 
and still be in hope because hope doesn't believe you've got it. Hope believes it's on the way. You say, well, wow, that's not so good. You know, <laughs> standing here saying I don't have it and believing it's on the way. I would rather believe I've got it. That's faith. Well, that's true. It would be better if you could just believe you've got it because that is faith. But you can't believe you've got it until you believe you're going to get it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. We've got to develop the reality of hope in our life. See, and we here in the church we should be the hope place. We should be the place where the community sees us and they say, hey, that's a place of hope. The Bible says, Paul put it this way, he said, if you don't have hope, you, you're just to be pitied. In other words, you're pitiful if you have no hope. And the world out there basically doesn't have much hope. I mean, they, they put hope in all kinds of goofy things. I mean, some of the goofiest religions in the world. I mean, there's, there's this group developing now that saying that we have evolved from trees. And I'm thinking, well, then how come we still have trees? I, I'd like to ask them that. Well, and they'd probably say, well, some trees were smarter than others. I don't know what. But, I mean, that's goofy. Would you agree with me? Why would you put your hope in an ancestral tree, the reality is they have no hope, and they know they have no hope. But we have hope. The, uh, you, many of you have heard me tell this story, but uh, many years before we started this church, Loretta and I were visiting a church. Uh, there's 150-some churches here in the three-county area that we're in. Miller, Morgan, and Camden County, all I'll tell you is of one of these churches. We were visiting a church, and we were in the balcony, and this church had an exit on each side, exits under the balcony and exits on either side behind where the musicians stood. There were six or so exits in that church, and we were in the balcony, plus or two exits in the balcony. And at the end of the service, uh, at the end of the 18-minute regulated sermon, the... Um, I don't abide by that. But the uh, deacon of the week got up every week, and he, each week they had a different deacon do it, and he would close in prayer. And one thing that they always did, it was ceremonial, he would ask for a prayer request. It didn't really matter, they didn't have any. But uh, this week he said, do we have any prayer requests? There was a gentleman uh, standing at the back of the church. He was under the balcony. I could hear him, but I couldn't see him, and when they asked for prayer requests, he started walking forward down that long center aisle toward the front of the church, and he got to the front of the church, and he, he was, um, I'm just guessing he was in his 70s, he had bib overalls, a white t-shirt underneath, farm boots, he was obviously, uh, this was a rural agrarian community, he had obviously been on the farm all of his life, uh, he was not a city boy. You know, city boys talk different than country boys. And so he came down to the front. He stood there, and he, and the, I mean, you could, you could hear the Winston rappers. They were ready for church to be over. And uh, so <laughs> he turned around, and he looked at the congregation, and he said, and he said this. I've never been to church much. Now, he said it in his dialect of the, of the community he was in. He said, I've never been to church much, but I did go to the doctor this last week. The doctor told me I was going to die. He said, I looked at that doctor and I asked him, I said, Doc, isn't there something you can do? Isn't there some kind of procedure? Isn't there... I didn't use the word procedure. He was, he was using more common language. Than that. But isn't there something you can do to get me fixed so I won't die? He said that doctor looked at me and said, Sir, your only hope is God. He said, I'd never thought about that much. He said, all these years, 
My farm is just down the road down here. So all these years I come to town, get my feed and everything, and he told a little bit more there, but he said, I come to town to get my feed. I drive right by this big old white church. That church had been there for, I think they said, they celebrated their 110th anniversary when Loretta and I were there. He said, I've come by this big white building. He said, you know, I'm on my way home from seeing the doctor. He said, I just got this thought in my mind. God's anywhere. He's probably there. So uh, here I am. Quit talking. Here I am. Standing right at the front. Pastor sitting over there on a red velvet chair. Music director and the deacon of the week. I mean, they, they look shocked. And uh, so deacon of the week, he says, well, pray. He prayed his, you know, they prayed over the food and we're on our way. And, and I went over to the edge of the balcony with Loretta and we looked over the edge. And it was just like, I never will forget the image. It was like spokes on a, on a wooden wagon wheel. And this guy was in the middle. Everybody headed toward an exit. Everybody. I'm telling you, you know, the, the, the pastor and the deacon and the music director went out those two doors in the back and people started going out those doors on the side and we could see them coming under the balcony. People were heading away from that guy like he had the bubonic plague. You know, he was contagious or something. He's just standing down there came to the house of God because the world told him his only hope was God. He shows up at God's house, scared God's people so bad they ran away from him. And I'm standing at the balcony, and I told Loretta, I said, we got to get down there. Well, the balcony was all clogged up, you know, because everybody was wanting to, you know, get to Pioneer first. And so they were going down. By the time we got down there, he was gone. So weeks later, every week, I asked different people, whatever happened to that guy that came down the front? Nobody knew. Nobody ever saw him again. I don't know. I, to this day, I don't know. But what I do know is this. We're the people that should have hope. When we have a hopeless world out there and a hopeless world comes to church, we shouldn't just say, well, we don't know. No, we, we should have something that the world doesn't have. We, we, should, we should be able to get people into hope so that at least they can know that there is a solution. Maybe they don't even believe it's for them, but at least that they know that there is a solution, and then once they believe there is a solution, then we can move them up to where they believe the solution works today. They may still not believe it works for them, but they may think that every now and then somewhere God does a miracle, and then they move up, and after they keep hearing the word, Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you give them the hope, and the hope in a way is kind of like the hook that brings them in, like, oh, at least there's hope here. And then, but we keep moving them up the ladder until finally one day they don't just believe that God can do it or that he does it sometimes. They believe he will do it, and he will do it for them. And then they believe it so strong that they believe as far as as far as I'm concerned, God's already done it. That's faith. But faith is the substance of things hoped for. And this is why Paul was saying, don't give up your hope. Because once you give up your hope, you will never get into faith. See, once you're into faith, it's almost impossible for the devil to knock you out of faith. And you get into faith, and it doesn't matter what happens around you. It doesn't matter what things look like. It doesn't matter what people say. If you are in faith, you cannot hardly ever get knocked out of faith. But while you're in hope, while you're in hope, the devil kind of got a little bit of a shot. If he can get you to get out of hope or even get you stuck in hope where you believe God does stuff, but he only does it for missionaries overseas. Yeah, I heard of a guy that got healed once. I guess from time to time. God actually does it. Get people stuck in that mode. There's entire churches stuck in that mode. We got to start believing that God does it. He does it today. and He will do it for me. Say this, God will do a miracle for me today.
God will do a miracle for me today. My God will do a miracle for me today. That's still, see how good you feel? That's a confession of hope because you just said he hasn't done it yet. You said he will do it. He will do it today. That's a confession of hope. And there's nothing wrong with that. But once you get established in that to a certain point through the word pouring through you, you'll start believing that God's already done it even though you don't see it. That's why the scripture says we walk by faith and not by sight. Because if you go by sight, sight looks like it's not done, can't be done, will never be done. But inside you say, it's done. That's faith. And we need to move into faith. Wow. Well, we just need to know and have remembrances. I, uh, in my office, I grabbed a glass out of my office. I like blue, by the way. Uh, I mean, green's okay, but everything in my office is blue. I had a 1960 Pontiac Bonneville lowrider back when lowriders weren't cool. And I had blue lights in the wheel well. I'm talking in the 60s. White rolled and pleated leather interior with a blue dome light. I like blue. Yeah, I like blue. One day I was adjusting the dome light. It was variable intensity. While I was going down the road, that's kind of like texting today. And so I was going down the road adjusting the dome light. And as soon as I got done adjusting it, because it's kind of like back here, I had it, my radio changed colors as you change channels. It was an experience to go on a date with me. <laughs> I had technology before technology was cool. Man. Blue lights up under the dash. White carpet. I made people take off their shoes to get in my car. I'm in high school. I made people take off their shoes to get in my car. Because I had mohair carpet. <laughs> you know what mohair is? <laughs> okay. Now I wish I had mohair. Oh, well. That was a joke. But I was adjusting my dome light. And just as soon as I finished adjusting my dome light, I looked up and there was a policeman sitting on Blue Ridge Boulevard, parked, writing out a ticket. And I went into the side of his car. Think you have a bad day? You got a, you got a policeman writing a ticket and his car is parked right behind where he's standing. And some 16-year-old kid comes up over the hill in the blue flame. I went, didn't hurt my car at all. Those Bonnevilles had big bumpers. Messed up his lower left quadrant, though. He came over and started yelling at me. And he saw all those blue lights. I don't know what, he thought maybe an alien ship had landed or something. <laughs> and he, I never will forget, he said to me, back it up, back it up. Will that thing run? Back it up. And I, I, I backed it up. I mean, he's standing there, got a gun, got his little ticket thing. Some lady sitting in there, he's writing a ticket, and he's screaming at me, back it up. And I backed it up. And all he would say was, get out of here. If that thing will run, get out of here. I left, they never gave me a ticket, never gave me nothing. See, I had favor starting when I was 16. But at any rate, I like, I have this bowl up in my office, this Interior design lady a few years ago did some stuff up there. They put some marbles in a bowl that's so I don't lose my marbles. But, you know, the scripture says that uh, 
When Moses went from one place to another, God would do a miracle, and then they would build a little altar. And sometimes they would build a monument, and it was so that when they would see it, they would say, oh, yeah, that's right. God parted the sea for us. You know, you need stuff sometimes to help you remember what it is that God has done for you. And he saved your sorry backside over all these years. You're here today because he loves you so much that the goofy thing that should have taken you out didn't take you out. You're here. You're here. You're in church today. You're watching online. At least you got eyes. I'm telling you, God has been looking out for you. And sometimes we need to remember how much he has done for us. How he has saved us. It will give you hope. Well, these marbles up in my office, and there's many, many of them, I've gone through and just thought of the dozens and dozens of things that God has done for me. And I try to not walk past this little bowl of marbles without realizing something that God has done for me. You know, my son, he was, um, when he was born, he had pyloric stenosis, which today they treat. But back in the day, they didn't know what to do except just cut you open. And he, it's a muscle on the bottom of the stomach that tightens up in such a way that a child cannot get anything into their intestines. And he was a newborn, and every day he got less weight. Every day he had less weight. And so by the time the doctor looked at him, uh, I was at the office, I was at work, and Loretta called me and she said, the doctor said that they're bringing a helicopter right now, they're going to land it down here at the Camdenton Airport, they're going to take him to Columbia for an emergency surgery, and I said, well, why don't we pray about this? And she said, well, here's the thing, the doctor says if we don't do it right now, he's going to die today, he'll die today. And uh, so we prayed anyway. And just really got this idea that there was a certain doctor. Just you know how ideas come to you? You ever stop to think that sometimes God speaks to you and gives you an idea? Sometimes you think, well, that's a stupid thought. Hey, maybe it's God. And we got this idea to call a doctor in Clinton, Missouri. I, I would give his name, except we're broadcasting. But, um, and he's still still alive, still practicing, but uh, we called him and said our son's been diagnosed with pyloric stenosis, they want to do an emergency operation right now, they say he's going to die, he said, he said your doctor must not know about a breakthrough that they've had, in, and he said, I've got some stuff here, if you can get him here, I can give him medication that will start healing that right now, so we drove uh, 100 miles, 70 miles, however many miles it was to this town, and took him in and got it done. Well, the doctor that was wanting to fly him to Columbia told Loretta to her face, said, listen, you can get this procedure done over there, but let me tell you something, he will always be puny. And I've often thought about that. My six foot four son, when he was in high school at six foot three, weighing 235, 40, 50 pounds, whatever, and captain of the championship state football team, that had he not done that, he might be six foot nine, weighing 400 pounds. <laughs> I don't know. But I mean, he's he's big boy. That was God. That was God saved an operation and saved my son. That was God. A few years later, my son was uh, riding a bicycle on the top of a boat storage building. Um, don't ask. I don't even, we, to this day, we can't figure out how he got it up there. We don't know. <laughs> and he decided to be Superman. And uh, so when we found him and the bike on the concrete in front of the door, 
at any rate, he had broken his wrist. And uh, I have permission to say this. Uh, we took him to for sale, and we took him to see Dr. Lyle. I mean, if you know Dr. Lyle. And uh, he broke this bone right here. There's a little triangular bone in here, and this bone affects the growth of your hand. And Dr. Lyle was very concerned. He said any other bone, it didn't really make any difference, but that bone right there, uh, if it happens in a child, it can keep the hand from growing. And he was very concerned about that. So he said, what we want to do is we want to set this and put it in the cast and get it all right. And then uh, next week, I'm going to have you come up every week. And we're going to check it every week. We may have to re-break it and reset it or whatever. So we're, that's fine. And so they did what they needed to do. And we're on our way home. And we're on Highway 5 between Versailles and uh, Graboy Mills. Some of you say Graboy's Mills. Some of you Gravi or some of Gravy Mills, whatever. But <laughs> so he's, he's, he's sitting in the back seat, little boy sitting in the back seat. He's got, his, got a cast on. And, and he says, uh, uh, Dad, I'm, I'm healed. I said, yeah, that's right. You know how it is. Don't look at me with that righteous look. <laughs> I go, yeah, that's, that's good, Loretta, he's healed, okay. And we're driving on down. And he says, no, 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 Dad, I, I prayed, and I'm healed. I said, well, he said, I, I may still have to wear the cast, you know, till next week, I'm healed. That's really nice, you know. So we go home, and a week goes by, and we take him back up to Dr. Lyle, and Dr. Lyle comes out, and he looks at me, and he says, he says I don't get it. He said, I'm leaving that cast on there. I think it was 13 weeks. Said, I'm leaving that cast on there for the full time. He said, I cannot find a break. He said, I can't find where it has ever been broken. He said, the x-rays are as though nothing has ever happened. Praise God. Memories. I remember we were going to take Loretta to Bothwell Hospital in Sedalia. And uh, she had a growth on an ovary the size of a grapefruit. We'd gone in to have it checked, and we'd prayed. We believed. But we went in to get it checked anyway. We still go to the doctor. And uh, the doctor says, well, you know, it's not cancerous or anything like that, but we, we need to remove it. It's, it's causing a lot of problems in her because it's so big. And uh, we want to schedule surgery for in the next two or three days. And they did. And so it was the night before we were going to uh, go to Sedalia. And our children were preteen, but they I'm just guessing they were probably somewhere around 10 or 10, 9 and 11, somewhere in that age group. And so it's the night before, and I said, well, you know, we all need to go to, to bed because we've got to get up early in the morning. Mom's got to be in uh, Sedalia. She's going to the doctors to have a procedure done, have a surgery done, and, and uh, we've got to leave real early in the morning. I think we had to, come to think of it, I think we had to, like, leave at 5 or 6 in the morning so that she could be there. And uh, one of the kids said, well, why don't we just pray that she's healed and then she won't have to go? Well, I'm a man of great faith and power. And I said, well, we could, but Mom and I have already done that. I said, but we haven't. You know, and I'm thinking, well, how cute little kids. So they asked Loretta to sit in a chair in the center of the living room. They brought, they'd seen us do that at Bible study. So they brought a chair out in the middle of the living room, one of the kitchen chairs, and Loretta sat in it. And Robbie got on one side and Sherry got on the other side. They just prayed said what they'd heard their parents say. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we know healing is for today. We know it's your will. And they said it in child voice, but they said it. They said, uh, in the name of Jesus, we command this body to be healed. We command that thing to 
be gone. It's not supposed to be there. So that's nice. <laughs> you kids go on to bed now, and we'll, you know, we got to get up early in the morning, go to surgery. And so we did. So we got up the next morning, and I took him to surgery. Took Loretta to Bothwell Hospital. And um, I say, Jeff City, it's in Sedalia. And uh, so she goes in to have her procedure done to get this grapefruit size growth, benign growth, removed. And so the surgeon comes out. I, I never will forget, I'm standing there getting a Coke. That was back in the day when I drank, used to drink soda. By the way, I haven't had a soda since 2001. It's been 11 years now. But uh, I used to drink it, a lot of it back then. And so I was getting a soda at the soda machine, and the doctor comes out with his scrubs on. And he's got blood on him. And he says, Mr. Allison? Yeah. He said, about your wife. And I thought he was, she's dead. I mean, you know, well, hey, well, you got a surgeon standing there with a panic look on his face and blood on him, and he hasn't even taken his stuff off. I guess they do that now, but back in the day, he probably wore it home. I don't know. But... <laughs> I said, yes, and he said, your wife. He said, we had the operation. And I said, did you get it? And he says, no. He says, he says now this doesn't save you any money. He, he did tell me that. He said, this doesn't save you any money, but he said, when we got in there, there wasn't any growth. I said, it's shrunk? He said, no, it's gone. It's just not there. There wasn't one there. He said, it doesn't cost you any less. We still had to do it. But it was not, and I'm thinking, dummy, I could have saved thousands of dollars if I would have just had the faith that my children had, you know? Well, the faith of two children, that's what I think of when I see those two little marbles that are glued together up there in my office. Praise God. I say, well, but you don't understand. My situation is different than that. It's not just a, a healing. It's, my, situa my situation's impossible. It's not like I can't get the door open. It's like I'm in a welded-in stainless steel box and there is no door. I would tell God how to get it open, except there's no door to open. This is hopeless. It's anchored here, and it's anchored here, and it's anchored here, and it make, those anchors make this impossible over here. I'm just in a no-win situation. Do you understand with God there are no no-win situations? The Scripture says that what... Man thinks is impossible. God says it is possible. And the only reason that an impossible thing won't happen is because we believe it's impossible instead of believing it's possible. Some of you may know this story because I've told it four or five times over the years. But I love Brother Hagin. He told a story a time or two, didn't he? But I had been asked to speak at uh, Quincy, Illinois, at the, at the university there for a non-denominational meeting. I, I think it was Full Gospel Businessmen's conference that they were having there. And they had rented the uh, student union, which was probably, oh, about three times the size of this room. And they had a big stage set up and had some famous musician in. And you know what that's like. <laughs> you know, had, had a famous musician in and a lot of people and pastors and stuff. And, and I was supposed to be the speaker that night. We'd flown up. And, and on the way up there, I had a, a, a Cherokee 6, um, 300 horsepower was the plane I had at the time, and the door wouldn't completely close. It was, well, when you're traveling 185 miles an hour and you have a door that won't completely close, the door is closed, but it makes a noise. You know, <laughs> irritating. You know, you're trying to. And I was not really, now I know you can't picture me this way, but I was not really in a good mood when I got there. I, I know, you just can't even picture me that way. Because I'm just such a happy guy with my new cufflinks. So um, at any rate, when I got there, I got to the meeting, and I kind of went away from everybody. Of course, I'm kind of a shy person anyway. You guys don't see that side of me, but I am. I'm kind of a shy person. I don't, I don't like big crowds. I like to keep separation here. You know? <laughs> now, I, I like the bigger the crowd, the better. But I'm kind of, when I'm by myself, I'm kind of like hermit almost. And... Uh, So I, I went up, I, I tried to get away to myself, maybe get rid of the bad attitude that I had, you know. And it didn't seem like prayer was working. 
And so I'm talking to God. And so I'm talking to God. There's this guy that comes in at the back of the auditorium. And when he comes in, his arm is completely twisted around like this. His, his foot is completely backwards. And it looked like he had been maybe born this way. And his head was all the way over to the side. And he, and he walked like this. And only his foot was all the way around. And I remember saying to, to the Lord, because I just wanted, I was going to speak at a church the next morning in Quincy, and I was going to fly back, and I was just, I just wanted out of there. Have you ever been in a place, gone to a family reunion or anywhere, and you just, maybe there's a lot of good people, a lot of good stuff, but you just feel like, I just want to go home. Am I the only one that's ever been that way? I mean, I, for some reason, I, I love the Lord, and I love teaching the Word, but I just didn't want to be there. And, and I was praying when I saw that man come in. And I said under my breath, and I felt so guilty. I said, dear Lord, don't let that man come forward for healing. Because I knew if he did, it would just prolong the service. <laughs> and I was thinking very selfishly at the time. And as soon as I said it, I repented. You know, but, but I remember I did say it. Well, the service got started, and I tell you what, the anointing of God fell in that room on the people. And, and it, I got excited. I mean, I, I was preaching like my hair was on fire. I, I mean, I was running around. I, was, I mean, I was pumped. And I got to talking about, about healing and all this kind of stuff. Now, a little side story that's going on. I have a friend who is a senator, right? And he heard I was going to be speaking at the college there in Quincy, Illinois. He couldn't make it. But he had a friend from the country of Lebanon. That's the country right above Israel. And this man is a businessman. Don't even know if he's a Christian or not, but he's a businessman, and he was going to be in Quincy that night. So the senator, friend of mine, called the Lebanese businessman and asked him if he would come to that meeting that night and say hello to me on behalf of the senator guy. And so he did. Well, the Lebanese business guy, he's there in this shark skin suit. You know, it reflects sunlight, you know. And, I mean, he's, he, was, he was styling, okay? And he evidently had a lot of money. Well, he was there that night, and he got all inspired by my message. So he went over and got the guy who was all twisted up and said to the guy, you want to get healed? And the guy goes, yeah, I think so. And so he brings him up to the front, all right? Now, when we had the altar call, uh, when we had the altar call, there was like five or six steps that went all the way across, and about 25 people came forward. And so I started to walk down the steps to minister to them, and right in the middle of the front was a lady who acted like a snake. And you say, well, how can somebody act like a snake? Well, she was, you know, she was doing the slithering thing and making her... Her tongue was coming out. You think Kiss thought that up? I mean, her, her, her tongue was coming out, you know, and she was doing a little slithery thing. Well, see, look, demons don't scare me. In fact, if I see somebody that I know is not just goofy, but they're demon-possessed, sometimes people are just goofy all on their own. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? So, at any rate, I knew, when I see a demon, it's just like, Hello, I know what to do. I have all authority over all the power of the enemy. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Demons do not scare me. Turn your head around, spit out peas. I don't care. It doesn't, it doesn't scare me at all. Because I know, that's one thing, I know, I know my authority. And so this lady's acting like a snake. I had seen that before. I saw that with Norval Hayes down here at Lodge of Four Seasons one night. And I, I know those things, all you got to do is say the name of Jesus and get halfway close to them and plead the blood, and they're gone. They can't handle it, okay? So I was going down the, I mean, my eyes were big. I was ready. I was locked on. I'm going down the stairs, and halfway down the stairs, the Spirit of God speaks to me and says, don't mess with that woman. She's a distraction. And so there was a man, pastor in Quincy. His name's uh, Young. His last name is Young, Pastor Young. Uh, tall gentleman. I did not know it, but he kind of specialized in that kind of thing. I didn't know it, but I turned to him and said, Pastor, would you take care of this lady? He goes, 
So I mean, and he was there. And so I turned and I looked down to the left, and down at the, all the way at the end was the crippled man and the Lebanese businessman standing next to him, kind of helping him. Now, like I said, I don't even know if this Lebanese businessman is saved or not, but he's excited. And the, the gift of faith was distributed to me. You know, the Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that God distributes the gifts to each one. The Holy Spirit distributes the gifts to each one individually as he wills. Our duty is to receive them. And there was a blend of gifts going on there, the gift of healing, gift of miracles, the gift of faith. But the gift of faith came upon me, and I knew that I knew that I knew that that man had been healed. It was done. I walked down to him. To everybody else, it was like I did this every day. And to me, I'm thinking, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> because my mind is still trying to figure out what's going on. But my spirit man and my heart, I knew. And I came down here, and I looked at him, and I said, would you like to be healed? He looked back at me. Keep in mind, his foot's completely, completely around, side by side with the other one. His arms twisted, and his head's like this. And he said, yes. Obviously had been that way from birth. I'm guessing he was probably in his mid-50s. I uh, did not get the charismatic grip on him. You can do that, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And sometimes the Spirit of God moves that way, and it's really great, you know, where you get the grip on him, you know, and you go, in the name of Jesus. Ah! You know, you know, and I like that. To me, that's, but the Lord just didn't do it that way that time, you know, because I was, oh, I say, in the name of Jesus. Don't. God. I mean, I was, I was wanting to do that because I like it, but it just didn't work that way that day. And I just heard the Spirit of God just say, just lay your hand on him. So I laid my hand on him, and his head was so twisted sideways, I actually laid my hand on his neck, which is kind of odd, you know. And I just said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Hold my hand out. And that's all it was. Oh, I, I said, oh, I said to him first, I asked him a question, or made a statement. And this statement does not sound like a faith statement. But I know that the statement was from the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God gave me the words specifically to say. I said to him, I said, if you can believe that you can be healed, you will be healed. And he said, believe. I laid hands on him gently and said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Now keep in mind the Lebanese businessman is sitting, standing right next to him. And he's watching this. The friend of the senator. I got a letter from a lady who was in the row, up in the files somewhere. And she said, see, it took about 15 to 20 seconds for that man's foot to turn around, hand to straighten out, neck to straighten out. 15 to 20 seconds seems like that. No, no. When you're there in real time, it seems like two minutes. You know, I mean, seemed like a long time, but in reality, it was probably 15 or 20 seconds. But his foot straightened out, his hand straightened out, his neck straightened out, and he stood before me as straight and as tall and as whole as anybody ever. That lady in her letter, she said, it sounded like somebody slowly breaking celery sticks, is the way she described it. You know, just, just celery sticks breaking. The man was healed. Later that night, the a uh, couple other things happened that night. Later that night, the uh, Lebanese businessman followed Loretta and I to the restaurant, followed us. And he came over to the table. The first time he came over to the table, he said, I saw a miracle tonight like I have never seen before. I saw a miracle. And he, he was on his knees at our table. You know how the waiters do down at... At restaurants, sometimes they get down. He was on his knees at the table. He said, I saw a miracle. Tonight. I, I, I saw a miracle. Just touch me. I saw a miracle. He was so excited. 
Before the meal was over, he had come over three times. The second time, he says, I, 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 I'm, I saw something tonight I can't explain. The third time he came over tonight to our table, he said, I know I saw a miracle. Didn't I, did, didn't I see a miracle? He'd already begun to doubt. Just give him the length of one meal, and the guy's already beginning to doubt what he saw God do. You wonder sometimes, how can people believe without seeing when some people see and they can't even believe? But I read this, this next thing I'm getting ready to tell you about. I read this letter to you at the congregation here a few years ago, and once again, this letter is still up in a file someplace. But that night, later that night, I was feeling pretty, pretty good. I mean, you know, my, my uh, wanting everybody to leave, I wanted everybody to stay. I wanted that meeting to last all night long, you know what I mean? And there was this lady came forward, an elderly lady, and she came, she had a, a, a stick, uh, one of those, you know, those um, that blind people use, you know what I'm saying? And they, they just do it, and it kind of like unfolds, and click, 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 click. And, and she was, had walked around, there was a young man helping her. I say young, he was probably in his 40s or 50s. But he was helping her, and she came up to the front. And I knew that I, I, I had just seen the greatest miracle that I have ever seen in my life. Up to that date, I've been in all, all kinds of meetings. I've been in meetings with T.L. Osborne. I have never seen a healing like the one I saw in Quincy at the university that night. And I've never seen one since. But I saw that. And that night, I was pumped. I figured I was going to be seeing that every day. Next thing I know, a blind woman comes up. That's no big deal. I went over to her, man, I slapped my hands on her, and I proclaimed in the name of Jesus she was healed, and I stood back and watched her walk away with her little. And she left, blind as a bat. Many years went by, and a few years ago I got a letter that I read to the church here. From her son and he said do you remember in Quincy Illinois the night that guy was healed there was a woman that came forward that was blind and you prayed for her and nothing happened I'm thinking salt in the wound here we go <laughs> yeah I remember that he said well that was my mama my mother he just recently passed away he said I just thought you should know this now that night after the meeting it was we went out into the parking lot and it had rained that day it wasn't raining, but it had rained, and there's a little moisture here and there on the parking lot, kind of like in the movies, you know. And uh, he said the parking lot was wet, and uh, I think he said that normally he escorts his mom to the car, but because the parking lot was wet, they didn't want her walking or something. He went to get the car, had her waiting at the sidewalk. He went to get the car. He's going to bring it over. He gets over to his car, and he hears a scream, his mother screaming. He runs over to see what's wrong. What's wrong is that she's he said, he said she lived a lot of years. And I forget, you were here when I read that letter. It was 12, like 10, 12, 14 years. I forget the exact number. But she lived a lot of years after that. He said immediately after that night, she went to Walmart. And he said Walmart. She went to Walmart Optical to get glasses because she thought that's what people could do that could see because all of her friends had glasses. And at Walmart, she was upset because they wouldn't give her any glasses because they said she had too good a vision to get glasses. <laughs> all her friends had glasses, and they got them at Walmart. Walmart wouldn't give her any. Upset her. He said, but he said, I, I didn't know if you knew that or not, if anybody had ever told you. Well, I mean, he probably figured that Pastor Young or somebody had told me. Nobody ever told me. See, there's a miracle that took place. Didn't even know about it until after the lady passed away. He said she lived all her, she got her driver's license. Yeah. Here's the thing. You got a lady who felt like there was no hope. God did something. Tell you something, God can do something in your life. 
And we've got to get past this business of thinking, well, there's, I can understand how he could have hope because he's so young. He's so talented. He's so smart. You just go around, you just you pick out people, you know, and you say, that, but me? I, I, I'm just too deficient in too many areas, and time has passed me by. I, oh, there was a time when I thought it would happen, but not anymore. See, and too many people have given up. Some people live in a phony, phony hope. I uh, saw a movie years ago. Don't get mad at me because I saw a movie. Uh, but I saw, saw a movie a few years ago. It was, I think, a G-rated movie, and I can't even remember the name of it. But, and there was one famous actor who played several different parts. He played several different characters in the movie. And you, to the point, he was so good, you didn't even know he was these different characters unless you looked real close. You thought, same guy, you know. And what it was about was this circus came to town. And uh, he was, uh, one of his characters was he was kind of like a fortune teller guy in the circus. And he's sitting at the table with a crystal ball. Now, there was, it was kind of in a farm town, a small town, you know, a circus comes to town, it's the biggest thing that's ever happened, you know, that type of thing. And so there's this one lady in the town who is, Later in life, single, wants a man. Obviously, no man in that town had wanted her. But she really wanted a man. And she talked with her girlfriends, and they all agreed she needed a man. So they went to the carnival. So there they are at the carnival, and she goes into the fortune teller, and she hands him her 25-cent ticket or whatever, and she says, would you tell me my future? Tell me about... What's going to happen with me and about the man I'm going to meet and all this? And he says, you want the truth? He said, oh, of course, I want the truth. I want the truth. Just give me the truth. Tell me how wonderful it's going to be. He said, okay. He takes the ticket and uh, he said, today was like yesterday. Tomorrow is going to be like today. And every day from here on, for the rest of your meager life, will be uneventful. No one will love you. No one will care. And then, in your old age, you will die. No one will mourn your passing. The earth will be no better or no worse for you having ever been here. Give me my ticket back. So she goes outside, and all of her girlfriends are outside, you know. They said, what did he say? And she said, he said I'm going to find a tall, dark, handsome man to marry me. You know? Well, let me tell you something. All the world has psychic hotlines, psychotic hotlines, idiots and palm readers out there making up stuff or working through familiar spirits. The world has nothing for you. The world doesn't have good news, and any good news they have, they make up. I listened to the news this morning, it wasn't all that good. But I'm telling you what, God has good news for you. He has hope for you. It doesn't matter. Listen, you may think, well, the books are in on The books are not in on you yet. And the only reason that you won't get what God has promised you is if you quit believing you're going to get what God has promised you. God is the God of the supernatural. For goodness sakes, Moses, at the age of 80, was told, go talk to Pharaoh. I mean, you, you watch it on TV and you see some guy walking in there, you know, Charlton Heston, looks like he's a young, virile guy. Moses was 80. You say, well, I'm not Moses. And you never will be if you have that kind of thinking. You start believing that what God has promised you not just can happen, but it will happen. 
And his promises to you are awesome. See, don't give up on God. God hasn't given up on you. There's a miracle waiting to happen in your life. And you need to remember the miracles that God has done. You know, I, I carry in my pocket, just from time to time, various things to remind me of what God has done, of what God is doing. Jesus said he wasn't all that concerned about the meal, but he said when you get together to observe this specific meal, he says, I want you to remember something. You know, you, we, we need to start remembering what it is God has done. You are no accident. God has a plan for your life. What he has planned for you, he's capable of fulfilling. Don't give up on God. It doesn't matter if the doctor says you're going to die and you got one day to live. Hello? Don't believe what the doctor says. You believe what the Word of God says. You don't walk by sight. You don't look at the doctor's report. You don't look at the financial report. You may have a goofed up family. But you can be the light that shines in that family. And you may say, well, you don't know my sister-in-law. She could never get saved. The devils are scared of her. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Your goofy sister-in-law can actually become a dynamic woman of God. You may say, oh, pfft. not my sister-in-law. Well, you're right. You're right. Not your sister-in-law. And I know that because you just cursed it. We, we got to quit saying it'll never happen. And we have blessings out there we're cursing. We have blessings we're cursing. I'm done. Get the worship team up here. While they're coming up here, I'm going to tell you one way to curse your blessing. This is a long story, abbreviated. I gave a car away to somebody one time, and they didn't want it and they wouldn't pick it up, and they left it there. I left the keys with the pastor of the church. I said, give this car to that family. That family didn't want it because the car was green and they were believing for a blue or something like that. I told that story. It's a big, long story. And finally, one day, after a few months went by, I went up and I said, do you still have the keys to that car out there? He said, yeah. I said, give them to me. I drove it home, and I gave it to a guy in Tulsa who appreciated, who drove it for years, and who liked it. Okay? Now, here's the deal. They may have been believing God for a different car, but the car that I had to give to them could have been their seed, could have been their seed that they, they knew it wasn't their car, but when it was given to them, it could have been a seed that was somebody else's car. Are you following me? And then that would have been the seed that would have got them what they were believing God for, but they wouldn't follow through with the process because they were so caught up in pride and full of themselves. And we need to not be full of ourselves, but we need to be full of the Holy Spirit. Ready? Watch yourself. You ready? Don't want you to get hit in the head now. Don't want the blessing to knock you out. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to a place with you right now as a church, as a body of believers, where we say we rededicate our lives. We're hitting the refresh button right now. What we have been allowing malware to get in and clog up, we say we've got 
your supernatural Holy Spirit antivirus working through our system right now, cleaning us up, straightening things up, putting things in order. We're defragging the hard drive. We're, we're going to get where you want us to be. We repent. We renew. How many of you will say, I'm starting afresh today? Lift your hand. Lift your, keep it up. Keep it up. In the name of Jesus, I see this as a coming to the altar of God, a request, a statement of saying, I rededicate. Say, I rededicate. I rededicate my life. I rededicate my life. I rededicate my life to you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our God and our King. To Him will we sing. In His great mercy, He has given us life. Now we can be called the children of God. Great is the love that the Father has given us. He has delivered us. He has delivered us. Children of God, sing a song and rejoice for the love that He has given us all. Oh, children of God, by the blood of His Son, we have been redeemed and we can be called.
that's called the everlasting maybe we have in God be
Hallelujah. Let's just worship him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I'm going to ask the altar ministers to come forward now. You're here today. and You need prayer. The church is here to agree with you in prayer today. It's healing, a broken heart. You just want to be born again. We're here for you today. Today is your day. Don't leave today without having what it is that God has for you today. Today is a day of restoration. Amen. The day of deliverance. The day that you can look back to in years to come and remember the day when everything changed. See, I remember that day in Osage Beach in February 2012, the day that everything changed.